from the Mercy One Studio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you live from these United States of America, where here in Des Moines, Iowa, Bud and I both work at Mercy College of Health Sciences. I'm the senior advisor to the President for Mission Initiatives and Spiritual Health and the director of the newly founded Center for Human Flourishing. Bud, what do you do over at the old college? I am the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the academic dean at Mercy College. Uh, he gets choked up whenever he <laughs> talks about it, so that's why... Uh, you know, you you can't you don't have time to like go hit the cough button. Cause Gainful brings... employment makes me emotional. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it's always uh, underwritten by Mercy College of Health Sciences, mchs.edu. We want to thank them for underwriting our show and allowing us to have this wonderful opportunity always to come to you every Wednesday and talk to the good people of Iowa Catholic Radio, everybody listening uh, live on air, on uh, the internet, uh, and later on podcasts. So thank you, Mercy College of Health Sciences, mchs.edu. Yeah, Bo, uh, just wrapping up, I think the spring semester, gearing up for summer, there's still time to uh, look into some, yeah, well, we've always emphasized on the show that Mercy runs year-round, so one of the great um, I think, boons of running a college like that one. We uh, love to get the uh, ability to brag about our students. I actually, uh, to show that there's flexibility, I was on a class that went from 5.30 to 9 uh, last night. And uh, so I always want to tip my hat to people who um, put in the late hours to make sure that our students get um, all that they need. But it was a class on spirituality. And, you know, there's a way in which I'm sure people always can run by the idea of spirituality and healthcare, but uh, I was really hearkening back to some of the classes we got to teach Bud about getting to the essentials of why it is that spirituality and healthcare is not simply just a sort of add-on like, oh, well, maybe it's a nice thing to do uh, when people are there anyway, Uh, but what is it foundational about the integrity of of a human life where spirituality plays uh, that important of a role grounding uh, our our understanding of what healing and health might be? And this made me uh, not only happy that we work at a place like Mercy College. We made me nostalgic some of the uh, mm-hmm. in- interesting arguments we got to have when we've team taught classes like bioethics before. Yeah, we've talked about this on the show before, for sure, Bo, but one message that you can kind of get from our culture is that religion is kind of a nice hobby or it, these ideas sort of fall out of the sky and they can make your life more meaningful. But any sort of intersection with what's called real life is kind of bracketed from the beginning. And I, I do feel proud of our work. I think at Mercy, uh, I, I know of several conversations with students where we've got this great resource, the Catholic intellectual tradition, just meaning all the thought that Catholic thinkers have been have put into the faith and its application over the years. And um, I, I don't know. I was the, One of the favorite parts of my job was seeing the light bulb come on for some students where they're like, there's this whole resource, there's this whole tradition, this wealth of reflection that really can make a difference in how we practice medicine. As we've said on the show before, too, like the, the Catholic Church was at the forefront in Western culture of practicing medicine. And so that's, yeah, that's, that's a great blessing to be able to be a part of that. And I think it's a good segue into what we're going to talk about today. This, the Holy Week, of course, the great physician, Jesus Christ himself, who has came to earth incarnate as Jesus Christ, uh, is now turned his, his gaze towards Jerusalem he is now walking his passion, the way of the cross, where he's going to go die for our sins on Good Friday to be raised to a glorious resurrected life on Sunday. And this is the Holy Week where we celebrate exactly that, um, depending on um, how people name all sorts of stuff. The Triduum in earnest gets started next week, but a lot of people call today Spy Wednesday, which is sort of the events that really start uh, the whole narrative of Holy Week beginning. And so today we wanted to take time to talk about how uh, Holy Week, the events thereof, the Paschal, Paschal Mystery, everything about that, of course, has exactly something to do with talking about the common good. It's easy when we think about the central aspects of our faith to think of them as you know pious acts that individuals do, and of course we would never discount that. But it's always the role of our show to hopefully see 
the communal, the larger, the integrated, the Catholic, uh, in the, the sort of widest sense of the words, ramifications of these central mysteries of our faith. Yeah, we, we can talk about this more during the first part of the show, coming back, Bo, but I've always been struck by the phrase that the events of this week are the hinge of history. This is what, like the fulcrum upon which history turns. And so as Catholics, there is we don't have to be triumphalistic about it in a pejorative way, but we really have this confession that the events that we commemorate this week, they have a bearing and an importance for um, all people and for how, like you said, Bo, how we live our lives, not simply individually, but as a community together. So a lot to unpack on this morning's show for sure. That's right. Just making sure to set up uh, one of the uh, penitentially, one of the harder things to talk about the week before Holy Week, right? We shouldn't make it easy on ourselves. Well, you mentioned Spy Wednesday, and that was a nice foray during devotions last night with the kids because sometimes, okay, my boys right now are four and two, so not the strongest of attention spans. <laughs> when I mentioned Spy Wednesday, like Dominic's eyes really lit up. Like, got he wanted cool, to know right? how spies were involved in, in the devotions last night. Yeah, um, Finian, who is seven, is a uh, really into everything he keeps asking people do you want like blank car or a tank which would you choose and he's in he's in team tank uh so i think he gets really into it about like oh how mean were the soldiers and you're like well inappropriately mean like not in a cool way and he's like yeah 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 but at any rate what were the soldiers doing so uh i, I think that's part of the, the added fun of um making <laughs> making holy week work for every age group yeah there was some cognitive dissonance because when we were in rome we didn't know what exactly to buy for Dominic, so we bought him a soldier set. And I think it was supposed to be a crusader set, but this week he's seeing all these images of Roman soldiers, and we're trying to like properly distinguish between crusader and those who arrested and dragged our Lord across. <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always something, always a fun moment as a parent. This is the Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, and we will be back talking about Holy Week and the Common Good right after this. <laughs> Folks, if you want to contribute your contribution, your contrib- contribute your contribution. You want to do that? That's fine too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I need to. I deserve to be whipped over that one. If you'd like to contribute to the conversation around our show, you can do so with the Zip Whip line. No oh, pause. No, no. Okay. Five one five two two three eleven fifty. Five one five two two three eleven fifty. Your connection to our show and Iowa Catholic Radio. If you text into five one five two two three eleven fifty, the Zip Whip line. You will be able to uh, let us know any of your thoughts. Uh, I was going to say any of your dreams. I guess that too. <laughs> and uh, anything else that you would like to make sure that we are aware of, UCG, hashtag UCG for the uncommon good, the zip whip line. 515-223-1150. This is the uncommon good, and we'll be back right after this. Need an experienced attorney for legal matters? I know a guy. Stephen C. Reed, attorney at law, is a proud supporter of Iowa Catholic Radio. Steve is a longtime resident of Iowa and is licensed to practice in all Iowa state and federal courts. He has years of experience in real estate law, wills, conservatorships, trusts, and estate planning. Steve's law office phone number is 515-224-1776. That's 515-224-1776. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Christ is the Answer with Father John Ricardo is provided by Confluence Brewing Company, brewed locally and featuring regular, seasonal, and limited-release beers available at local stores, bars, and restaurants. Confluence Brewing Company at 1235 Thomas Beck Road, off the bike trail south of Grays Lake, and online at confluencebrewing.com. Confluence Brewing Company offers curbside service and would like to thank you for your support. Thank you, Confluence Brewing Company, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Storm Alert Weather is provided by Divine Treasures. Divine Treasures is a Catholic book and gift store serving the Des Moines community for over 25 years. Their mission is to help Catholics know, love, and keep their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. Divine Treasures is where you can find great Catholic books, beautiful Bibles, rosaries, jewelry, statues, and religious gifts for those memorable events in your life. Divine Treasures, 5701 Hickman Road, Des Moines, 515-255-5230. Thank you to Divine Treasures for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. 
Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security is a Catholic-owned family business supplying security systems, access control systems, video surveillance, fire alarm systems, and video doorbells. All alarm systems are monitored out of their monitoring center located in the state of Iowa. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this Wednesday. Thank you for being a part of our show. We're glad to have you here with us. With us today, Wednesday, is not an interviewee, but the story of our faith itself, Holy Week, the most important week of the year for all Catholics, all Christians, as we contemplate what Jesus Christ himself culminated and finished and then opened up for us through his life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection. And so we're hoping this week, uh, today, to talk about this week, as we said, in, in terms of the common good in Catholic social teaching. Of course, the, 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 the very soapbox bud that we're always uh, making sure to bring up. But I think it's important when we get to uh, the very pivotal parts of the liturgical year that we make a concerted effort to think about how, of course, you will have personal piety involved in dealing with, uh, in, in, in entering into the life of the church. Um, but we can take a step back this Wednesday, right before we get into full swing with the Triduum, and ask how is it that the mysteries of this week make a distinct mark on how we understand ourselves as a people, the common good, social teaching, etc.? Yeah, I like that attention you draw, Bo, to the individual and social dynamics of what's going on here. There's a... Um, there was a famous Catholic theologian, mid 20th century, Henri de Lubac, and he wrote this book, Catholicism and the Common Destiny of Man. And it was seen as kind of a landmark work because de Lubac was drawing attention to precisely the kind of ideas that you're talking about that so often in Catholic devotionalism or other kind of conversations, there was a tendency to reduce things down to an individualistic sort of application. And what de Lubac wanted to re-emphasize, I guess, in a certain way, is that no one of us is saved alone. Now, in saying that, and I know from conversations and and classes that we've taken, uh, like in theological circles today, I feel like the pendulum maybe swung too far the other direction, where now there's so much emphasis on the social dynamics of everything that we forget. This does have a bearing on on, on our personal lives. Like, if salvation doesn't mean something to me, we've sort of missed the point. But it's just this recognition, I think De Lubac was right to highlight, that when we're called by God, we're not called simply to sort of like, well, this this changes my day-to-day existence in terms of my subjective experience of the world, but we're called into the mystical body of Christ. So we can only know that salvation that God intends for me as, a, as an individual as a part of this larger whole. And I think this gets back to the definition of the common good as its essence, which this is a great point to bring up, but because even when we bring up what the common good means, there's a way in which it starts to be like seen over against an individual good or that it's an add on to the faith, right? There's the realities of the faith. And one of them is that the common good's important. And so after you consider the faith, here's how you should go do things for the common good. But what we want to say is Christ's death and resurrection is the ultimate common good. So a common good is a good that can only be had by individuals if it is shared. Yeah. So a common good is not um, a collective good. So it's not like, oh, the good for everyone else over and above the individual. But it is a good that individuals themselves possess, but they can only possess if it is held in common. And so salvation itself is the height of this. It's true that after this fact that Jesus has died and has risen that there will be people who will not be saved because of their choice, bud. But their choice is not this sort of individual thing, right? It's not like just one person after another gets to consider, do I love Jesus or not? Bing, bang, boom. You get a, you know, it's like you get salvation and you get salvation and you get salvation. It's not divine Oprahism. Yeah. No, there is a collective reality, the redeemed new creation. And you either enter into this communal reality or you don't. What you get, folks, in salvation is the kingdom of God, not your personal happy place. 
And so that starts to be the ramification here. Christ, through his death and resurrection, has actually submitted the principalities and powers of the world to the feet of his father's throne. This is a kingdom. This is a war. This is spiritual warfare where Christ is definitively won. And the question is, will you belong to this kingdom or will you stay with the kingdom of this world that will end in the lake of fire? And so it, you have an individual choice. You have individual things to do. But what you are choosing between is not just individual destinies, but to whom do you belong? To what group? To what body? To what kingdom? And this is the week where the definitive mark, the fulcrum of history, as you say, bud, occurs. And the question that appears to all of us is which common good, or it's not even that, which good do we want? There are only phantom individual goods in the kingdom of this world. The only good that can actually be had in its fullness is the common good of salvation in the kingdom of God offered by Jesus Christ on the cross. This is really essential, all that you point out there, Bo. And actually, when I was first exposed to Catholic social teaching, it was kind of a surprise to me, or it was sort of what we would call like a paradigm shift. And what I mean by that is when we think about freedom or goods so often in our society, we treat it as a zero-sum game so that if I have my own personal liberty, it might detract from yours, and it becomes sort of competitive. And clearly when we talk about the common good, in a Catholic context, that's not what we have in mind. But even beyond that, and when you were talking, my, my thoughts went to something that John Paul II said. He said, like, with the common good, it's not even simply taking every individual person's goods and, like, adding them up so that right. together they combine to form this whole mega good, <laughs> like Transformers that's or right. something. <laughs> but uh, it, like you're saying, if we have true justice or true tranquility of order – it's not even simply that we're like staying in our lanes. So I'm as long as I don't trespass on your space. There's it, it's a resource that we all like, take part in, and you can't detract from it by like if I access the common good, it's not like my spigot is going to take some away from yours. Right, and that's especially the case when it comes to the kingdom of God, because the salvation and the gifts that God has to offer they're infinite. This is where the feeding of the five five thousand it points forward to. The Eucharist, but with the with the body of Christ and the way that He's made Himself available to us supernaturally, it's not like we could we could consume all that and then it would be gone. Uh, we're called into truly eternal life. Now, the flip side there, Bo, and here's where maybe you can provide some pushback or clarification for me. When folks hear that, I know a common concern is if if God is so gratuitous in His giving, doesn't that in some way detract from justice? And so. I'm not even um, being flippant with this idea or or criticizing folks for having it come into their minds. But there are there are some who will say, like, say, for instance, you experience a serious tragedy in life, like uh, someone murders your child. If that person is allowed to partake in the eternal kingdom of God, is that is that just, you, you know, like in some ways it feels like God is making light of the serious wrongs that human beings can commit against each other. You're just trying to, like, throw out some easy questions yeah. at the beginning here. Um, I think part of this goes, I immediately think, when Thomas Aquinas talks about exactly this question, but in, he's first thinking about it in terms of God. So all sins are infinite offenses to God himself, because to sin is to choose to love something inferior to the superiority of God who deserves our love. And that can be a whole host of sins, and that's not to say that all sins are equal in any way. There are f- some far more heinous than others. But in the, the essential aspect of sin is to um, choose to love something below the creator and to do injustice to the creator itself. And it, this is sort of only amplified when we do things like destroy the image of God in another by murdering someone or uh, defrauding them or, you know, going down the list. And so Thomas points out that strictly when speaking about God, God himself, if you, if you are owed a debt, it is not injustice for you to forgive the debt. Because what's you are owed something, and if you decide you, you, you're like, you know what, I call it even, that's your prerogative, and it's not being unjust. So strictly when we're thinking about God and the sinner, God has every right, and, and I mean that like in a sort of legal sense, every right to decide that the debt um, doesn't need to be paid back to him. Now the question starts to be, of course, that there are no sins, or there are very few, it would seem, 
that don't have exactly the social ramifications that we're talking about. So that other people, of course, are wronged and have that sort of uh, a a debt held against the sinner on their behalf because they took something from them. And so this gets into the larger question about um, can God himself ask us to forgive others? And so this is where I think you have to say, because God has offered it so freely to us, we, with grace, not on our own accord, have to be willing to forgive others, even the most egregious of sins, even if it takes a long time or maybe in purgatory or maybe only when we're actually resurrected with God's grace. But, of course, God himself says that that forgiveness he asks is not going to be sort of of our own will. It would be, I think it would be wrong, and I think the pagans are correct to say that it's not within us in just human terms to marshal up the forgiveness, or very few people can, I should say, that can marshal up the needed forgiveness to forgive someone who's done some egregious wrong to us, but that through accessing the storehouse of grace that Christ himself has won through the cross and resurrection, again, this sort of communal sense, in a way, bud, we learn to forgive with God's forgiveness other people, knowing that it, it stretches and perhaps past the breaking point to ask humans to do this all on them, on their own and of themselves. Yeah, I think it's precisely this week, and especially the liturgy that we're going to celebrate on Friday, Bo, with Good, with Good Friday, that shines a light exactly on how grave our sins are and, um, and what it means to, to commit an offense and that it, it is caught up in this supernatural reality. Uh, now, of course, this kind of, this, this steers us a little bit in the direction of the way that different credit, tr- Christian traditions think about this. And even a great biblical scholar, someone like N.T. Wright, who's written some important works on the New Testament. I was reading him on this topic recently. And when he was talking about the Catholic idea of purgatory, he quoted the verse from St. Paul's letters that there's now no condemnation in Christ. And so the implication is if you have like this Catholic theology of penance and purgatory, et cetera, you're sort of perpetuating uh, condemnation, whereas, you know, God has completely forgiven our sins. And to me, especially as someone who's been in both worlds, the Catholic tradition is, uh, is realistic about what God has done on our behalf but also what that means in terms of our relations with both God and with other human beings. And so, I don't know, that that idea has always surprised me. Like if someone, say, breaks into my home and steals, you know, a, a lot of possessions, I could totally forgive that person. That wouldn't necessarily chuck out the window any sort of restitution or or even punishment. And so you use the phrase, I think, in the intro to the show about Christ as the great physician. Mm -hmm. And if we do have, if we do have a serious element, if our bodies have been damaged in any way, say you've slipped on a patch of ice and banged the back of your head. (laughs) (laughs) Just just to throw that out there. You know, it's the, the idea that that healing is available. If, if I go to the doctor and he says, look, you've got this gaping wound and these are the steps you have to go through to be whole again. It would be absurd for me to say like, well, that guy doesn't care about my health because he's asking me to, to right. take steps to make make that happen. And so, oh, I just thought you <laughs> wanted to heal me. You want me to do stuff too, <laughs> doctor? <right. laughs> and so, I mean, as as folks point out, like we we maybe sometimes don't see this completely when we participate in like a regular confession. So, confess one on one with the priest. But that whole process is really embedded in understanding that when we sin, it doesn't only affect me personally, like my soul. But it ruptures my communion or relationship with the body of Christ. And so the Catholic Church's whole system of penance is about setting things right. It's not about doing enough until like my, my feelings of guilt are expunged or whatever. It's about wholeness within my own life and in the life of the body of or, Christ. Or even making God happy. Like God's like, I was really bummed until you said those <laughs> ten Hail Marys. Right. No, I mean, I think that's important. You know, in the Exaltet, I, I, I just say this over and over again. The, the, the Easter song um, in the the, uh, the the Easter vigil, to ransom a slave, you gave away your son, right? That's what we, we praise God for doing. And so we could never make up for that, just like we could never make up. I mean, one of the things about forgiveness, right, is when you do something wrong, you actually can never make up what you've done. Like, all restitution is symbolic. Mm-hmm. So if I if I stole money from you, um, and I, and I said, I'm sorry about, I stole money from you. I thought you wouldn't remember because you hit your head on the ice. Uh, <laughs> here's your $20 back. 
even if like I gave you exactly the the same amount back, that um, time you didn't have it, I can never give back. And even if I gave back and I go, okay, here's it at interest, right? I'm going to give you the money that accrued when you didn't have it, like five cents or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, that still, you would never have had it at that time. I can't go back in time and make up for what I did. So all forgiveness already is symbolic. So when we think about the great fact that we would never be able to pay back God, not only for our lives, bud, but that he ransomed his only son to death to save us. Mm-hmm. When people get like <laughs> antsy about, oh, I thought God loved me. He wants me to follow some rules. You're like, even if they were, they're not arbitrary. We can go long into how they're not arbitrary. But even if God was like, on Tuesday, I'm going to make Christians stand on their left foot only. I think that's a good deal. You're like, okay, so let me get this right, God. You're going to ransom your only begotten son and save us from eternal damnation. But you want me to hop on one foot for a day? That would be like the greatest deal in the world. Now, of course, that would be sort of silly apologetics to say that because and I think we want to defend exactly something like Benedict XVI has made time and over again that reason and faith go together in ways that people are not, you know, that often don't see how they do. I'm only saying that, like, that that criticism seems to me to get it exactly wrong, exactly how you said, is part of it is, you know, if you've ever, yeah, you've raised kids and they've done something, they've broke something of yours, blah, blah, blah. You know very well as a parent they can't make up for what you did. That You'll never get that time back where you have to clean up for what they've done. You'll never get the time back where, like, you were just getting to be happy with your kid and now you have to correct them. So... It's not that you can ever make your kid one-to-one ratio make up for what they did, but in a pedagogical sense, you're like, you know what, you're going to go clean your you know, your sister's room, even though it's not your chore, because doing that will, like you said, get you in the habit of instead of doing this vicious thing, you'll do this virtuous thing instead. And so that is not a matter of condemnation, like you said, yeah. that N.T. Wright is throwing out. Um, it's a matter of being given the path towards perfection. And I think that is a, the next sort of social thing to talk about is Holy Week is not a one and done thing. Boom, now you're saved. Go do what you want. But it's a road to heaven and a question of if God will intervene for man to the extent of dying for him, God also will open up a path to be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah, it's funny because so often, well, I'll say in my life, but I think a lot, a lot of our lives, we think of God as the miser, like God is doling out graces or punishments, and he's the one who's kind of fretting about like, oh, Bo's gone off the path again or whatnot. But I think you see in the New Testament, and especially with the parables of Jesus, that it flips our vision, that so often we're the miser. So I, I think about the parable where there's the servant of the king, and he's forgiven. Now I'm going to forget the detail that I'm on air, but like 10,000 denarii, a huge sum of money. And the king forgives him uh, this this debt that he owes. And then as he's walking home, being for, uh, having been forgiven this debt, he meets uh, a man who owes him like 10 denarii or something. And he's furious. And he, I don't know if this is in the scripture, but I, I get this sense that he like, grabs him by the collar and is like shaking him like, you, you owe me this money. Throws him in jail. Th- throws him in, yeah, throws him in jail. And... Uh, and that's, you know, I think Christ with that parable is saying it would be absurd on the basis of what we've been forgiven by God the Father to act like misers with other human beings. I, you know, another one that I like is when I think it's it's Peter says to our Lord, like, how, how often should I forgive my brother seven times? And Jesus says 70 times seven. And to show you how much I can, like, struggle with this in my own life, the first, you know, like, when I hear that passage, I'm kind of like, oh, that's a lot. Like, I'm going to need a, a big notebook for that one, right? <laughs> He's marking off each time. <laughs> but but our Lord is 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 precisely challenging us. Like, you know, we've, we kind of want to set boundaries around grace and how it can be doled out according to our own, you know, oftentimes limited understanding of what's involved when God the Father, as you said, has forgiven us um really an infinite amount. And and I like the point too that you make, Bo, about the law that uh, and arbitrary rules. You know, Psalm 1 says that the the, the man who is, the person who is grounded in, in the law of the Lord, they're like a tree planted next to a spring of water and they continue to bear forth fruit. Um, and bringing those ideas together, you know, I think we precisely see that God is not a miser, that his instruction for us is meant for us to flourish. And insofar as we depart from that, uh, we'll be 
we we will be in a living hell. We'll be more and more confined to this our own uh, arbitrary system of justice, which is a kind of hell. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a perfect hell. Uh, when people go like, "Oh, hell!" Like, what sort of sick, twisted mind has to come up with that? And I'm like, I don't know. Just just hang out with people who get to do whatever they want for a while and see how that ends up. Uh, we you don't need. You know, there is a devil, but like the devil doesn't have to do a lot of work because we can develop hells all our own. And I think we've proven that throughout history. Well, this is the Uncommon Good. We're going to talk about wonderful things like hell and stuff again. If you hang around, this is the Uncommon Good. We'll be back right after this. If you want to keep up with what's going on here at Iowa Catholic Radio, easy to do. All you have to do is go be a part of our social media Jimmy, I almost said, said onslaught, but that sounds negative. So I'm going to say our social media outreach instead. Festivities? Festivities. Our social media festivities. You can go to the Iowa Catholic Radio website, <laughs> www.iowacatholicradio.com, where you can donate, listen live, sign up for newsletters. Go to Facebook, look up Iowa Catholic Radio, where you can be our Facebook friend. You can go to Twitter, at IA Catholic Radio, to follow our tweets. And then you can also download the Iowa Catholic Radio app. And anywhere you have data, even one spare datum, if you have that, you can listen live, you can donate, you can listen to things that we've actually recorded that are wonderful and good and pure and all those things as well. We are here for you with our social media armada. I like it. Mm. This is the Uncommon Good, and we'll be back right after this. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the sports report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. Forms, manuals, brochures, letterhead, envelopes, business cards, custom invitations, design, and bindery. Big Red Q Quick Print, located across from Merle Hay Mall. Online at bigredq des Moines.com. Big Red Q Quick Print. We make printing easy. What is the best gift ever? Giving a Catholic education is at the top of my list. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences, where you can chart your course for more. This is Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr from the Uncommon Good. Mercy College provides unparalleled clinical rotations, hands-on learning, accelerated education, and flexible schedules. Since 1899, Mercy College has been transforming students into healthcare professionals. Guided by Catholic values, our faculty put classroom theory into practice. Students are prepared for roles in service and leadership throughout their own careers. Learn more at mchs.edu. Here's your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. Gusty wind will continue through the afternoon as high pressure moves in from the west. It's a pretty cool air mass, and that'll keep us in the 40s for the afternoon. And the wind gusting over 30 miles an hour, we should get sunshine. Clear tonight and cold and breezy with our low near 25. A little bit warmer tomorrow with sunshine. We'll warm up to about 48, and then a big warm-up on Friday, mid-60s. I'm meteorologist Steve Hamilton on Iowa Catholic Radio. Back to the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this Wednesday. Thank you for listening to the show, and we hope all of you have a blessed and holy, holy week. Today's Spy Wednesday, so the sort of pre-festivities of the Triduum, but of course, starting throughout this week, we have Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday, uh, Good Friday. We have Saturday where we're waiting, of course, for Christ to be resurrected. Uh, We have those who are going to show up for the Saturday Easter vigils, uh, you know, commonly called Midnight Mass, but usually starting a little bit before that. And then, of course, Easter Sunday. And then we have the whole octave coming up where you are commanded to celebrate and have a good time. So, Bud, we really are on the cusp of the most wonderful time of the year. I know that people usually reserve that for Christmas, and Christmas, uh, I, I understand why it gets all the props that it does, but truly this is not only, like you said, the fulcrum of history itself, but something that good Catholics out there, you know, maybe you didn't have the lint you wanted, maybe you haven't done a great job, I'm now speaking in the mirror at Bo himself, you know, you might not 
have got spiritually where you were hoping to with your Lenten practice. But now is the time to throw all of that aside and think about how it is that the spiritual realities of Holy Week are waiting there for people to partake in. And once again, every year, come to that renewal, that deep-seated appreciation, that love, that hatred of sin, and that love of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And so that's what we're talking about today, bud. But as usual, trying to point out the sort of wider ramifications beyond personal piety in Holy Week, what has occurred to the common good, the body of Christ, the body of the world, social teaching, everything like that today. Yeah, it's significant, Bo, that the Gospels tell us that these events take place against the backdrop of the Passover. And when you get into the Old Testament, so to step back a little bit, I'm sure you know someone might tune in and say, like, well, why are Bud and Bo always harping on the common good? Like, okay, we get it. You know, like, let it go. But Change like, your show name. Yeah. <laughs> How about just regular goods? But when you get into the history of Israel, you see how much of God's actions in history are about calling a people to be set apart and putting all these things in place to make that a reality. And our Lord's sacrifice, this event on which all of history hinges, the gospel writers show us that this is rooted in that entire, like all that came before. The sacrificial system is was in many ways a recognition, like we've been talking about, of uh, the injustices that our sins involve. Like a sin is really a privation of the good. It's a rip in the fabric of the universe. It's not what God intended for life to be like. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I, I like that phrase that you use in the first part of the show. Like these, these things aren't arbitrary. God is putting things in place precisely for his people to be made right and to, and to know their ultimate destiny. When Christ comes, um, it's it's important for us to recognize that he doesn't simply wave wave a wand over what's there and say like, oh, everything everything is okay now. There is this there's this understanding in philosophy. It's called voluntarism that God can sort of just like say whatever is the case and make it happen. God is all powerful, but he also God always acts in accord with his own goodness. So the sacrifice, this willing. Uh, path to Calvary that Jesus takes and then offering up his own life. That's the ultimate expression of God's love. And I've mentioned on the show before, you know, like my own reading is a lot in the theology of John Henry Newman. He makes this interesting point that Jesus, the son of God would have become incarnate whether or not we had sinned because Christ is the perfect image of how humans are supposed to live. But with, with sin, with, um, with the wrongs that we've committed, when Christ comes into the world, the full expression of humanity, the full expression of love, it's rejected. It's rejected by sinners. And so his death on the cross, when he opens up his arms, he's making, this really is the birth of the church. And it's the, it's the opening of the door to the kind of community and the kind of way of life for which we are intended. Yes. All, all sin is a rejection of God. And so when Jesus Christ was God incarnate, he came expecting to be rejected. Um, it's not like a certain very um, roughshod understanding of atonement theory where, you know, God's like, I'm so angry. Where am I going to find the piece of meat that if it got destroyed, I'll be happy finally. And then Jesus is like, well, I'll volunteer. And then that, that like means his whole life and ministry and even his resurrection in a weird way is worthless. If that's the idea, it's just a matter of, needing the appropriate um, sacrifice to, you know, expunge God's anger. But instead, God intimately knows that his love is constantly rejected by humanity because of sin. So when Jesus Christ, God become man, knows he will be rejected. This is where, you know, was the cross uh, predetermined? Was it, how did that all work? It's sort of like a a secondary question or a question that sort of misses the point because knowing that we've already been rejecting God's love since the beginning of time. So Jesus comes as a man among us knowing he will be rejected, but knowing that he will make the very rejection the means of which we will be brought back to him. So our rejection of him that is culminated in the cross and not just everyone's individual rejection, But now all the powers and principalities of the world, all that humanity can muster has rejected Christ on Calvary. 
uh, the political system. And, and this is why sometimes when people really go on and on about Rome being sort of like the apotheosis of, of the ancient world's understanding of an empire, we mess this up sometimes make it like, isn't Rome peachy keen? And hey, Roman roads, cool, right? Uh, Latin, uh, vini, vini, vici, you know, great stuff. But actually the idea is Rome is all about the law and there's some way in which they are the sort of height of human law. But notice that human law condemns God to die. Not simply, you know, this is important, bud, that it wasn't a random robber that, you know, kind of killed Jesus. No, the legal authorities of the time killed Jesus. The religious authorities, the the very people that that God himself had chosen to be the, the paradigm of religion rejected Jesus. Everyone rejected Jesus. Humanity killed God. But God, knowing this, ranted at him, son, to make death, his death, the very way in which life would instead emerge, paradoxically it seems, from that very event. And so it's not only, it's true, like every song you've ever heard, and now I'm starting to show my 80s evangelical sort of like background. Yeah. Every song is like, then I found the hammer in my hand, right? Like, you, you know, yes, our sins crucified Christ, but it's very important that I, not just I crucified Christ, we did. The height of humanity did. The highest political authority did. The highest religious authority did. And in doing so, against our own very will, bud, we actually open salvation to all of us precisely through the cross. And like you said, it's important that people see that. You know, you, you brought up volunteerism just so people realize Bud's not saying that's cool. That's, that's a heresy, <laughs> right? Um, God himself does not just magically, he can't make anything happen because he can't make two plus two equal five and silly things like that. God doesn't go against his goodness and part of his goodness is reason and rationality. So God has allowed it where history itself and all of its difficulties and foibles now become the, the seed, the source, the foundation of our salvation. And that's why it is, of course, individual. You are saved by the blood of the cross. But we are saved through that event all wrapped up in human history. Yeah, and um, sorry, brain freeze right when I started talking. <laughs> I think what you're saying really unfolds the mystery as to why Christ speaks so much about kingdom and the reign of God. Look, as human beings... We're inherently social creatures. You can talk about what makes a human distinct from other animals. Part of it, I think, is that we're created to worship. But part of it is that our lives as human beings can only be lived socially. You know, we we kind of have joked in class with students or asked them before, like, how long could someone live out? Like, at what age could you put uh, a human child out into the wilderness and he would find his way and survive, right? Yeah, because like all other animals would do a, a better job, would be able to survive more quickly than a human. <laughs> but really, at the end of the day, none of us would survive. Like our, right. our, our lives are meant to be lived together. And you see what happens from that Tom Hanks film. If you're really cast away on an island, <laughs> right. you lose your mind, right? Yeah. And It's hu- volleyball time. <laughs> <laughs> human beings throughout history have there, – there's this natural impulse to, to form communities – and if you if you look at that history, they form communities around uh, different ideas or really around different rituals. And some of these things were, I think, a longing for the truth that would be known in Christ. So a lot of his, a lot of human societies have had sacrifices. They're just like really horrific forms of sacrifice. I think what Bo's saying about the Roman kingdom, it's not that it was devoid of good, but it was founded on right some level of exclusion and coercion where this peace that we provide it can only be a peace that's over and against yours and so the people of israel this was a real curveball for the romans because most of those that they conquered were quickly assimilated they're like yeah we'll give up what we've normally done for the sake of these goods that you provide but the Jews were more resistant, and they, you know, they of course they they clung to the temple and its sacrifice because that was how they knew and um, and interacted with God. But even like we have to be careful how we talk about this. But even with the the Jewish people, and especially when you start getting into some of those other sects like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there's this there's this human tendency to take even the the good gifts that God has given us and to pervert them. 
So like we said, the law was given so that the people of Israel would be set, set apart, that they would be a kingdom of priests and mediate God's love to the nations. But you see by the time that Christ comes along, and especially in his interactions with the Pharisees, there's a certain way where he's saying you've, you've taken this, this good thing that God has given so that you can know wholeness of life, and even there you've turned it into, like we just read recently in the liturgy about Jesus cleansing the temple, and the temple was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. But human beings had taken these good gifts and they had turned it into sort of like a system of, of exclusion where there was almost ways that certain kinds of people couldn't know the fullness of the blessing that God intended for all nations. And so with Christ, you have the founding of a kingdom that where, where true justice is possible because it's founded not on coercion, not on exclusionary methods, but on reconciliation, a reconciliation that we could only know through our own participation in Christ's sacrifice. And that's where, I mean, I mean Bo, we could, we could move the conversation, the idea of the church militant, because we truly are in a sort of conflict with competing kingdoms. But the way that we conquer is different, of course, than, say, what the Romans were about. No, I think that's a great way to put this as we you know get here at the, the last part of the show, is, you know, there's a question about holiness itself. Why does God set people apart? Because that can seem, you're like, bud, you're, you're talking about the Pharisees being exclusionary and elitist. Isn't that what you Catholics do, right? You have these rules, you're just trying to this, right? Isn't holiness all about exclusion and exclusivity? But of course, the question is, why does God set people apart? And he sets people apart for the sake of everyone else. Why did he make Hebrew, the Hebrew people his people? And the prophets say again and again, I did this for the sake of the nations and the Gentiles, that you might be separated out so that they can see the glory and grace of God and change their ways. Why is Jesus Christ himself so radically set apart? Not only is it, yes, he's sinless, right? Like that's part of the prerequisite. But he himself is set out to the, I mean, that's why he becomes the scapegoat, right? Why can we throw our opprobrium? Why do we lash Christ? Why do we put him up on the cross? But because he is so set apart that his set apartness, the ultimate set apartness, right? He's di- he dies, he's immolated for our sins. So that when he comes back now, that, like like you said that that that, that division that that chasm between us and grace has now been exculpated because Christ was willing to set himself apart all the way to the cross in his crucifixion and in his resurrection can now bring all humanity to himself so the church militant works yes in asking very much of people indeed Christ says he asks more than the law ever could because he asks you to sacrifice your very life but Sinners. Sinners is who he wants in his courts. And so even as the temple was a precursor showing this, right, there was the court of the Gentiles, right? The nations were welcome. That gets to be part of it, right? Yeah. Is they should have been there, but they really weren't allowed. There's the court of the Gentiles and there's the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is now open to anyone who will be baptized and follow the way of Christ. But the pews, my friend, should be full of sinners and not just Catholics who are sinners, we should want people to be close to the altar of God. We are not saying that we should draw people in to not demand things of them because we are demanding the only salvation there is, which is tough, to carry their cross. Everyone has a cross. Christ has waiting for us crosses for us to walk up to Golgotha with him. But, but you cannot use, to use Christianity to exclude sinners from hearing that call is the ultimate sin now. And too often, but I think it's fair to say that we've done exactly that, that we act like there's prerequisites before you can even be in the pews to hear the good news. And that's where, look, the traditional way is to say no one belongs in that room. No one belongs at the altar rail. But we've been asked and we've been given the way to be there. And so, friends, we must realize that the that we've been called we've been called to be in the world but not of the world we've been called to be a priesthood of a new kingdom we have an exclusionary sort of religion where we are called to be holy but we are only called to do that for the sake of those who are not there yet and so holiness in the church militant becomes a people called to be the great sign and signal and and, and clarion call to beckon the nations to come. And I think that that's sometimes what we fail to do and see in this week, but when we don't do a good enough job of of seeing 
the communal nature of this salvation. Yeah, I should be careful how I say this next part because I don't want it to seem as sen- like seem like a sentimental idea. But there's a certain way where you can read Scripture and salvation history as one long story of God's desire to draw close to us. And Adam and Eve, our first parents in the garden, they had this kind of closeness and intimacy. They walked with God in the cool of the garden. But of course, sin made that more difficult. And the temple, like, as Christians, we shouldn't look down on any part of the, the temple system. That was God drawing close. And the even the artwork within the temple signaled that this was a restoration of the Garden of Eden and what was known there. When Christ comes, it's not that he does away completely with that. It's that he intensifies it. So you mentioned the Holy of Holies. And under the Old Covenant, the temple was a great gift, but there were still these kinds of barriers. And it was precisely because God is all holy. There's this like electricity to his holiness. With the coming of Jesus, the temple is his body. And so we're able to draw near in a way that those under the Old old Covenant that they longed for, that they looked forward to. Um, But it doesn't... like. God is still all holy. And our sin, it's like we've been saying, it doesn't detract from God, but we're sort of like the kid who has done some wrong. I'm thinking of a story from my own life. And you show up to your to your house and you see your parents already waiting for you on the porch. That wrongdoing, it's it's not that your parents are like, okay, it's over. I can't love you anymore. But in their presence, you recognize that you've brought shame to their name and that, you know, that has to, like we've been saying, be made right. And the, the the amazing events of this week, you know, call to mind all of those really powerful mysteries. No, I think that's right, uh, exactly the way to, as we get to the end here, you know, when we say that this is the age of mercy, because Christ has, has done these things for us through his cross and resurrection, we have mistaken the word mercy as easy. It's easy to have mercy. But, you know, but I go back to what you said at the beginning. Forgiveness is the hardest thing you can actually do, to be honest. So when God says, you will be merciful as I am, that's actually much harder than if you could just follow a law, Yeah, actually. To, I mean, mercy is tough. And mercy is, of course, in some ways, the strictest form of justice. It is not a simple idea like, oh, mercy, all's forgiven, forget everything else. No, mercy is to say, what is the ultimate goal of justice itself? And if justice is to give each their due, God, God deserves a choir in heaven. God deserves to be loved and worshipped and adored and glorified. God deserves sinners sinners saved to be a part of his kingdom. And so we actually live in these end times which are more intensified with, like you said, the electric holiness of God. It's not that being a Christian is easier. It's open to everyone. But actually, once we are baptized to live in line with Christ, to die with him so that we might be raised, that is the ultimate request for God to be near us, but to be within us, bud. And as everything in the scriptures point out, our God is a God of, I mean, this is the Hebrews, right? That that our, our God is a God of fire and that to be near him is to be both loved and to feel that love, but to also uh, be afflicted, afflicted with holiness that we now have uh, God himself making demands of us because he's drawn so near. And so that's both exciting, uh, but also the right type of holy fear, right? Not servile fear where we duck away, but realizing that we've been called to something so much holier and higher and uh, loving, uh, but difficult. And these mysteries we celebrate this week prepare us, invite us, and invigorate us to do those things. This is the uncommon good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our families, our city, our state, our nation, world, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the uncommon good, and we'll be back next week. But if folks want to pray with us, of course, at any time, but especially during Holy Week here on Iowa Catholic Radio, what are the ways that they can do so? If you're looking to meditate on the mysteries of Christ's life, especially the events of this Passion Week, we invite you to join us Praying the Rosary daily at 5.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 9.30 p.m. You can also pray the Rosary anytime using the Iowa Catholic Radio app. On air, we also pray the Angelus at 6 in the morning, and then at 3 in the afternoon, pray together the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And folks, if you want to, we, we cover your prayers very much. It is through prayer that we are convinced that Iowa Catholic Radio has been able to be the ministry that it has. But this truly is a ministry, and as it is a ministry, 
It, of course, does not just involve the people on air, the good people behind the boards, or even the people in the offices. It includes you very much so. We rely on you for the spiritual work that is done. Your prayers allow us to be able to spread this message of the gospel, also your volunteer time. But certainly materially with your wealth and your treasure, you have made Iowa Catholic Radio and its ministries possible to be heard throughout central Iowa and everywhere that people can listen online or through the podcast. We want to thank everyone who donated during the Carathon, but we also want to extend that offer to let you know that through the uh, weeks between Carathons before our concerted efforts uh, for, with things like uh, um, you know, golf outings or, or the, the various uh, programming that we have to try to get people involved in our ministry. We are sustained throughout the week by your generosity, and we want to thank you for doing so. But please keep in mind that we are able to have this ministry solely based on your support. We thank you for it, but we also ask you for it as well. You can go to iowacatholicradio.com or the Iowa Catholic Radio app to donate online, or you can call 515-223-1150 to talk with someone about setting up donations. Thank you in advance, and uh, pray for us, especially this Holy Week, um, as we um, all together get to celebrate this great uh, feast. So, Bud, do you have any sort of great um, plans for what you're going to eat immediately after Easter? This is a debate in my household. Some of the kids want brunch. Others feel like without uh, ham, it won't be a true Easter but one thing I appreciate about our friendship, Bo, is you always invite us to celebrate, to really lean into the octave of Easter. So that's been a good reminder for me each of the 15 years I've known you. I know. It's not fair because uh, Bud is, does a much better on, uh, job on the fasting element. So I got to be I got to be on team feasting and really make a good show of that. Well, Bud, to you and yours and everybody who's listening, blessings this holy week. Happy Easter. And we look forward to talking to you all next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.